you know, every time I took a toke, I would get too high, man. I was like beyond astronauts. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? So it's a, it, you know, we was on journeys all the time. Um, the best parts were, were when we were freestyle. So we would put the beat up and we would try to figure out like, okay, what's this beat telling us? What kind of song is this going to be? And either, you know, we would all be freestyling or, um, piece from uh freestyle fellowship would come over sometimes you know we'd have or um the wascals would be over all the time and we'd just freestyle for hours and we have like dat tapes and dat tapes and dat tapes of freestyling and from that freestyling we would like find parts like there's the hook right there let's roll with that and then per song you got like four different perspectives let's say officer for instance you got four different perspectives on one you know one topic and i think that was the healthy thing about being um the far side and being a part of the far side is like you know you have different opinions you know right. that different people can relate to like you got your you got your your fat lip folks and you got your slim kid tray folks and you got your uncle imani folks you know and that's kind of how that was, you know. It was some, some really fun times. There was a lot of playing pool all day, you know, because like, we would have lockouts, like two- and three-day lockouts. Like, we don't leave the studio at all. Mm. Like, we would have, like, uh, lunch brought to us, you know, ordering lunch, burritos, huge burritos, and playing pool. And then right. going down and checking back on the session or or you're in the corner somewhere writing your verse or rewriting your verse because, you know, the crew listened to it and we all collectively think that you can do better kind of deal. You know what I mean? So don't take it hard. Just go rewrite it. You know, that's just how we work. You what, know? Was, what was the creative process like? Was there many uh, disagreements? Um, how did you guys come up with the topics and uh, how did that gel together? There's a lot of disagreements, definitely, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Well, that album just seemed like such a fun album, like there couldn't have possibly <laughs> been one disagreement. No, uh, bro, you don't know <laughs> us, man. <laughs> disagreements is like, that should be the name of the, the record. <laughs> disagreements. Tons of disagreements, but they were all healthy, constructive criticisms, you know, um, that... And and there's there's just so many parts. Like there was parts where you know, like maybe Jay Swift wasn't wasn't there a lot. You know, what I mean, because he was out and about doing other things. And then you're just sitting there at the you know at the helm. We gotta we gotta keep steering this ship. You know, so I was I was there like a hundred percent of the time, just at that at that console, trying to make you know make all the parts happen. <clears throat> and then you 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 know, cause we all like kind of we all co-produced the whole deal. Because you have to produce it. You got to see the thing through to the finish. You know, if you let things drop or drag, <clears throat> it's kind of like your ass. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's your ass, you know. If you, <laughs> if, that's your, like, dude, like, it take nine months to make this record. Mm. You know, that's a, that's a pregnancy, basically. Right, right. You know what I mean? So you got you to gotta, you gotta see it all through. You got to eat right. You got to do everything. You got you to gotta nurture this situation. And, um luckily i mean we were we were able to do it our, our love for what we do was the thing that made this record magical and helped this record to come through you know right people I, love it people love this all right man man it's crazy. i'm telling you i remember being an 18 year old i'm telling my age a little bit and seeing uh your mama premiere on your mtv raps for the first uh, time i was uh, immediately blown away uh what was the uh, immediate reception like when you guys dropped that as the first single Ooh, <clears throat> what your mama that yeah one? yep oh so remember we were talking about uh we <laughs> like a lot of problems yeah <laughs> disagreements <laughs> so the your mama video was definitely a problematic <laughs> fucking disagreement as video and we fucking hated it and um we didn't like the directors fuck oh man it was just we was like fuck this shit uh we didn't have as much as control as we wanted on that video <clears throat> and it was cool it was quirky you know we had some fun as we were doing it but um underneath it all 
we knew the behind the scenes part, we was mad as fuck. Mm. All right. Um, so when it got the play that it did, it, you know, it did what it did and it was cool. It got, it introduced us and who we were. Um, but from that point on, that was our last video where a director was telling us what the fuck to do. That was it, you know? And right. so, because it was our money. And when, you know, we have somebody telling us like, you're just the artist. <laughs> what, you, what? <laughs> what you say? <laughs> I'm talking about that LA snap, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> right. It came out, huh? Yeah, the hood, the hood. He 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 touched the hood. He struck the hood stroke. You know what I mean? Right. And we just we just snapped on it, you know. And um, that was that for that. But the future was different. It was a lot different. Uh, we read through all the treatments properly, and it's hard for a, a director to um, back then. Uh, it was hard for a director to really pull off what he said on paper. On paper, it reads beautifully. But after you put it, you know, you film it and edit it and stuff like that, it's got to, it's got to, you know, right. Got to look like what the fuck you said. And it doesn't. And financially, like $70,000 back then, that's a lot of fucking money. And it's ours. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. Like, hey, motherfucker, you're not about to tell me shit about, you know, our money. That's right. what's up. And so I wish that the technology of today was available for us during the time we would be bananas you know what i mean right, like our imaginations right. were just too expensive mm. <laughs> real talk right you know <clears throat> like other fish video was like 70 grand back then mm. and we still need this water was still murky <laughs> you know right yeah we was trying to get that crystal clear shit and it just you know that's just where it was but if we had the technology that we do now man we was really looking to, we were striving for the for some other shit all the time. Right. You know? Uh one of your viewers noticed that the uh C D version of I'm that type of nigga is different from the tape version. Uh do you recall that and the reason behind the different versions? Yeah, the reason behind it because of sample clearances, you know, um we they wanted us to take it off. The you know, <clears throat> so it it was a different version. But if you got the, you know, if you got the version that uh, we enjoyed, then congratulations to you. <laughs> you right. got one of them, them uh, cla a super classic because it was exactly the way we wanted it. So the other one was kind of, I don't know, you could just tell the difference when you hear it, you know? Right. Certain things just bring out certain energy in you. <clears throat> and it has that, you know, that bounce and that flare, you know, that magnet, that magnetic energy. You know what right. I mean? So remixes, oh man, remixes are not your friend sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So that's what I was at. Uh, without a doubt, passing me by took the far side to the next level. Personally, how did life change for Slim Kid after that single dropped? Um, it's really funny because it's all the same to me. It's not like um, there was this big thing that happened. We were all, because we were so focused on music, you know, and we were focused on music so much in our shows and touring. Um, we never really came down. We were just always, you know, in that, in a zone. Um, I think we had to stop touring because we needed to make a second record. We needed to make, because uh, otherwise we would still be just touring. You right. know, that, that, that first record just had so much on it. Um, but, yeah, um, I felt the same, bro, you know, because it's the way that we felt about music and how to make music and stuff like that. I never really got caught up in any kind of star thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. we just, we just, we want to be here. Right. We want to just keep making dope music. And um, there's always good times. And we always had good times. We was traveling and doing stuff before all of this. You know what I'm saying? So, like, uh, we don't know. <laughs> right. so it's kind of all the same. You know what I mean? We were, I mean, being on the Living Color was super cool. That was like, those are like some super cool things back then, you know? Right. Or just, and we were working so hard. Um, we were working really hard. I mean, like going, doing shows and doing promotional tours and autographing, uh, passing out cassettes and just, you know, like that, that, that grassroots stuff that you had to do back in the day when there was no internet. And it was just foot, you know, you had to do a lot of stuff on foot to go gold. That's what we were doing. So it was kind of 
um, hard to see where we were at the time. Right. I think one one magical moment though, when we really felt like, wow, we, I think we re I think we did it, guys, was when we uh, during Lab Cabin, and we heard running on the radio. I mean, like all day, every ch like we couldn't every station you turn to, it was running playing like in a minute, like two minutes. Here goes running again. Right. And again and again and again and again. And I was like, wow. I mean, we were all like, wow, that's that's magic. And we were in San Francisco, too, at the time. Uh, I think we were going up to uh, KML or something um, to get on the uh, station and just to hang out. And they, it was just blowing up everywhere. And I think that was a magical moment. Uh, you got your own track on the album, your solo uh, joint, Other Fish, uh, which uh, yeah. you got production, I believe, with LAJ, or is that soul production yourself? No, that was uh, LAJ. Okay. Yep. Um, so, uh, Easy L. Rockwell, a viewer, wants to know what went into that song, and was there any uh, tension, the fact that you got your own solo joint on that uh, album? Um, no, not really. I think we were kind of team players about all of that. Um, but the the version that you hear on the record was a remix. So LAJ remixed that. And there was uh, there was two other versions of that. And when I listened back to it, it was just not meant to be. Like at, at, at the moment, like you, you're in it, you're like, oh yeah, this is it's dope. This is a dope song. But when LAJ uh, did what he did to it, that's when everything clicked. That's when uh, the melodic thing came, the energy came out. And I was like kind of in like a, uh, a certain sad headspace anyways, and like kind of in, in tears and stuff like that. And I was like, that was emotion. I was following emotion, the lead of emotion over the over record. And that's, what, and that's how it came out. You know what I mean? So um, the magic happened at that point. Um, you know what I mean? When the chariot arrived, the rider could ride. You know, right. we can move forward and go forward. So that's what that was. Uh, the single, for better or for worse, was uh, your last single. When it was all said and done, was Slim Kid, uh, were you happy with this project as a whole? And did everything happen the way that you uh, thought it would? Um, for, for, for better or for worse, or the, the, whole the, whole the whole project? The whole project. Oh, man. Yeah. Like, like, like did uh, you guys want any guest appearances that didn't happen? Any outside production? I mean, did any everything kind of, is there anything that we don't know that was supposed to happen that didn't happen? Yeah, well, there was, so we were pressed for time. And the song My Man uh, didn't get on there like we wanted. And My Man was such a, it was a John Clemmer, uh, a John Clemmer sample. And we wanted that song on there so bad. And it's just the different parts. Like, uh, Jay Swift had really made that shit, like, bang. Like, well, it was, it's incredible. But we didn't have time because our we had to get going. Like, we didn't have time to finish it. And thank God that we kind of did. And because we actually redid that song uh, maybe a couple years ago. And if if Delicious decides to tag that or put that song onto uh, the record so because it's in the it's in the um the liner notes the song is in the liner notes but it didn't make it to the record so that was one thing that was a bummer for us because we wanted to have like a complete thought and a complete thing you know happening for that you know for that time capsule so right. hopefully they'll tag it put it all together <laughs> no doubt for the fans you know want it. press it up you know that that would be cool like the missing the long missing song you know right uh, before we move on to Lab Cabin, California, uh, can you take me back to your favorite tour memory and maybe a f favorite tour lineup during this time? Oh, man. Well, my memory of earlier stuff was kind of, yo, we was, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of good times. <laughs> um, but one thing that I can recall that was a favorite of mine is um, being on Rock the Bells mm. tour. And that's when we had kind of come back together uh, to do an actual tour. And I remember we were on tour with De La and Tribe in uh, Japan. Mm. And one thing we were sitting on, we were, everybody was sitting in the lobby and we we're like, you know what? The U.S. would love this tour, you know? And so that was years ago. And it didn't that type of tour didn't occur until rock the bells happened 
because then there was De La Soul on the tour with us, and uh, and Tribe Called Quest was headlining, and we were on there too. We were headlining with them, and it was just kind of that was bananas. And then to have it, um, I think when we were in LA, it was like sixty thousand people, right? Right. And it was crazy. Like um, I've been performing for so long, but I I didn't really have nervous energy, but I had kind of like energy of like joy and overwhelmed with like how happy everyone was and how we you know we were we were happy but we still weren't fucking with each other really but we was we was what i did love about us is we kept it professional always and that's more than everything because that's how we've always been we had the same work ethics and everything doing our stretches and meditations before the shows and the whole deal and we stepped to the stage man and it was a wrap Right. You know, I like how we cooperate no, no matter what our differences uh, were, you right. know, period. You know, we always, I mean, like, we always had, like, you know, fat lip from, t fat lip from time to time, want to change stuff at the last minute. Or, you know, I was like, no, dude, we just worked, we just spent hours making this one thing go like this. And now you want to just change it at the, in the 11th hour to go like that? <clears throat> but right. I think that's time, this time we were like, all right, we're going to just do it. And so we we took we we did it, and he was able to get certain elements, and the whole show uh, was a, was amazing. That tour was galactic for us, you know. After it was all said and done, uh, after the bizarre ride to the far side, there was a three-year gap between your albums. What was going on with Slim Kid and Far Side, and why so long in between albums? Oh man, life, life, relationships, just. Oh man, there was so much going on. Uh, a lot of shrooms, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. Shit. <laughs> you guys, yeah. Life happens. <laughs> lot, lot, lots going on, man. You know. So I'll, in, in short, I'll put it this way: you got to live life to be able to create. Um, you got to have input for output. So that's it. I guess it took some three years of living and having actual situations that you can, you know, topics can come about, you know, you just can't keep, you know, making cookie cutter shit. You know what I mean? You got to right. create new things and come up with a new sound Think, Oh man, we went to, we went to New York and we lived in New York for like six months, um, producing the lab cabin record. First we was, first we was in LA making the record. Once we decided, once we got off the road, and started working we did all the kind of stuff that we did you know um, back home and then we had a listening session uh to see where we were at and that listening session let us know that we weren't finished and uh, so we were like yo we gotta get q-tip on the phone let's let's get up to new york let's get the folks you know diamond d uh gingy brown this one cat um, when we got out there you know oh man it was Got out there and, you know, things changed a whole lot. Uh, who else did we work with? Oh, man. Showbiz. Mm. Also. You know, Showbiz and AG, you know what I mean? Like, um, and we had to live life there, too. You know what right. I mean? So there was a lot of different things going on that uh, started to shape what Lab Cabin California uh, turned into. You know what I mean? Right. We're going to get into that Q-tip John Doe story here momentarily. Uh, what uh, personal adjustments uh, did you make going in to the second album? Anything that you uh, adjusted, uh, mm -hmm. learning from the first album, that you said, okay, I'm not doing that, and let me adjust yeah. it to the second? I think all the adjustment was in how we handled uh, the Yamama experience. Because that, you know, we had to take the reins, you know, into our own hands again and really make the solid sound decisions. And luckily everyone was mature enough to be able to, we all had the same goal, us and the label, basically, you know? And so sometimes I didn't know everything, you know? Or sometimes, you know, folks didn't know everything, but we already had some checks and balances. We had LAJ, we had Rick Clifford, who uh, was the engineer for, um, you know, for Snoop Dogg on some stuff, some Snoop Dogg stuff, and and uh, oh my goodness, I'm trying to think, Tupac. You know, he did stuff with Tupac. You know, he was he was with that camp. So we always had checks and balances everywhere, 
and we were about the quality. Right. You know what I mean? So that was, knowing that, it helped us to steer into where we were going. Uh, why not keep the same momentum production-wise with the first album? What changed and why uh, go to New York to seek out producers such as Q-Tip, Showbiz, and others? Um, well, because we were always, even from the beginning, we was like headed towards that, that East Coast sound. That's what we wanted. That's what that's what got us to the dance floors all the time. You know, that's what you know, that's where the bar was really high. You know what I'm saying? And the bar was held really high. And we wanted to man, it's it's almost like we wanted new to make New York happy. The East Coast, because when you think of hip hop, I think of the East Coast and and your your shit gotta be tight. And if you get their approval, we get that approval, we needed that stamp. Well we wanted that stamp. Why? Because we're stepping into a world that was it was i mean i don't know it's just like your elders you know what right. i'm saying I, we wanted to be respected in the sense that we just wanted to be respected bro because we didn't want to treat hip-hop wrong at all right you know what i mean we want to step in there fresh we wanted to do it just like they did it or better you know what i mean and so that and that's just what it was um and plus like uh la i mean um Jay Swift was busy with uh, Jazzy Fat Nasty's project as well as um, the Waskos project. And man, people, oh man, for our fans out there that don't know about our little brother group, the Waskos, get that record because the Waskos was definitely some good, that was a good record. And the right. beats was dope. And man, we, we would have loved to have those beats too. And they were just in a zone. And this was our creative family. So they weren't far from us. They were just doing their project they were always in the studio with us or coming to the studio jay swift was you know there from time to time too but he had to have his heads in on uh fat house records and all that he was doing um on that note and you know i don't know you just kind of do different things right you know there was plenty of projects that was going on i was working on brian austin green's um album uh me and L.A.J. were working on that record. Me and L.A.J. were working with um, with Chris Lighty, rest in peace, on uh, Deanna Brooks Jackson's uh, album at the time. There was a lot of music going on. We was we was trying to be the well. We were pretty much like going to be like the first neo soul kind of situation with our Deanna project. Me and uh, L.A.J. You know what I mean? And it's a lot. It's just a lot, bro. There's a lot right. going on. So you know? the, sto the story goes that Delicious Vinyl sent you guys out to New York to come back with beats from Showbiz and Q-Tips and, and producers of that nature. Yeah. Uh, but uh, fortunately, that didn't happen. I think Q-Tip was busy with other projects he was yep. working on. And Mob can you... Mob Deep, yep. So can you tell me how the story takes a turn at this point? So it took a turn uh, in a positive way because Q-Tip was... Man, Q-Tip loves us. And he was like, look, I'm a little super busy. I, I'm tied down with this, you know, a couple of the projects, but I got this cat that I want you to check out. And so we went to Q-Tip's house and um, we listened to this cassette tape with a bunch of snippets on it. And uh, <clears throat> I tell you, that was history, my dude, because it, uh, it was JD. <laughs> it was JD's tape. Now everybody know him as J Dilla. And we were listening to uh, snippets. We listened to um, bullshit on there. Running was on there. Drop was on there. I mean, just these beat snippets alone. And we were like, yo, that's, that's what we needed. And Q-Tip, um, we would love for him to do, to have done some beats, but he did us a solid by giving us something that he had in his secret pack. You know what I'm saying? Right, and we were the first for we were the first for that stuff to you know come out with with running and, and drop. That 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 put the stamp on it. Jay Dilla was on the way, and then you know Slum Village, and man, it's like the rest Slum Village. God damn, <laughs> right. D three big up big shouts. Uh, the whole Detroit crew, thank y'all because they took sacrifices by letting us utilize those songs for our project. Right, you know what I mean. Right. So if it wasn't for 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 Jay Dilla, T three, you know F Frank and Dank, all them folks, yeah, man, you wouldn't have no running, in in the stuff that you hear on Lab Cab in California because they made it possible for us, and we're grateful. 
Story also goes that you brought these beats back to Delicious Vinyl and they weren't too happy. No, no, no. I don't know about that. Well, man, who is you talking to? Imani. <laughs> <laughs> he said oh, they sent man. you guys out and they wanted you guys to come back with... Uh, maybe it was the name. Maybe it wasn't the fact that the beats... Maybe because he didn't have that name, they were like... Maybe. Maybe, you know, it's this... You know, so many meetings we had. I don't know if I was in the office at that time. <laughs> right. There's there's plenty of, um, it could have been, but you can't stop Delicious from um, rocking with Jay Dilla right now. They, right. They, they push Jay Dilla like big time, you know? Right. Um, and I think they were always supportive. They kind of, you know, there was parts, there was times when they weren't supportive of us and what we were doing. And it's only because everybody has their way of thinking of what is best for this particular, uh, a particular situation, you know, and that creates a lot of tension and stuff like that because, man, I'm gonna tell you, there wouldn't be, she said, wouldn't have, wouldn't have been on the Loud Cap in California record if it wasn't for us fighting. Right. And I mean, like she said, was the last song, she, she said, was almost that, um, like my man on the first album and didn't make it. But we, me and LAJ sat up all night and fought hard and we were mixing it and we were getting pressure from DV like, yo, you guys got to turn this, turn this in by the morning or it's going to miss the record. And I'm like, can you guys stop fucking calling me? I'm trying to get this shit done. <laughs> right. Like, bro, like, don't even answer the phone no more. Don't even answer the fucking phone. And so we like put our heads in like super hard and, and got the mix um, nice like we needed. It was, it was a little sharp in, in, four, in the 4K area and it was fucking on my ear. And we were trying to um, kind of get this one little thing under under wraps, and we didn't make it. Um, but it got it sounded good enough for us to turn in because we figured in mastering they were going to take off that whatever was bugging and bothering us. And so when I turned, like we were so tired, I think we left at seven a.m. in the morning to go to bed. So that was the last song on Lab Cab in California. Sent it off to uh, with a courier. Sent it to uh, to DV, and I went to sleep. Woke up with a phone call or some texts. Um, actually, we didn't, didn't have texts at the time. It was like he had a beeper. <laughs> mm, right. But I, I woke up with the phone call, and it was, you know, Rick Ross was like, yo, man, this shit is amazing. I am so sorry. And I was like, man, I told you. I was trying to just, y'all got to trust us. You know what I mean? And uh, the rest is pretty much history. Uh, it's a lot of fights that actually happened that, you know, you got to fight for what you love. You know what I mean? And, man. It, if it was if it if I didn't fight hard, a lot of them things wouldn't have happened. You know. Did you did you find it more difficult with the creative process with the guys during the first album, or was it becoming more uh, difficult with the second album, or did things get better? It's all the same. It's because it's all the same because we all care about um, our the project, Farside projects. It's all the same. There will always be. Anything, there will always be a struggle for some, for for something, but the right kind of struggles. Um, but you still you can't let people talk you out of your vision. Right? They okay, don't understand. And so, since people don't fucking understand, you don't tell them shit. You just do it, and then and then hit them with it. Right. Give them that. Give them that ugly face. Like, Ugh. you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Just hit them with it, because uh, you know the proof is the proof is right there with it. 